The Road, a sermon delivered by Dr. Rob Blackburn on December 1st, 2013 at Central United Methodist Church in Asheville, North Carolina. Our passage this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 9. Hear now the word of our Lord. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And a voice says, Cry out. And I said, What shall I cry? All people are grass, their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. <laughs> Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. With Isaiah as our guide, we're going to traverse these days called Advent together. And following his lead, we're going to call these days the road. Everybody here, you know something about roads. I think everybody we got here this morning by using a road. Human buildings, we, human beings, we build and relocate and redirect um, roads. Um, because they attend to our needs, our commerce, our longings. But then there are the roads not made of asphalt, the unseen ones of metaphor, the ones Robert Frost would talk about. Along the way, we all find these roads converging in yellow wood, and the choices we make make all the difference. Now, now there were some among us who would say, oh, you know, all this this." this talk about the roads of life. It's kind of nonsense. But I would suggest this, that even the cynic and the disinterested really cannot avoid the paths of life. Remember Alice in Wonderland? She bumps into the cat. The cat's sitting there on the side of the road, and she says to Mr. Cat, Mr. Cat, um, which way am I to go from here? And he says, well, that depends on where you want to go. And Alice says, well, I'm not sure where I want to go. And Cat says, well, then it doesn't really matter which way you choose. And Alice says, but I want to go somewhere. And the cat says, oh, you're sure to do that. <laughs> yeah. You see, people can refuse to ponder these things. You can refuse to make up your mind, but you can't refuse to make up your life. That gets made up with or without your careful and prayerful intention. Every day we get up and we move away or towards something, we put our foot on some path. That's why Jesus, uh, he didn't say, I am an idea to be considered. He said, I'm the road, I am the way. And when followers, followers gathered around him, what did he do? He didn't build a little spiritual fort in Nazareth. He got people out hitting the road with him. It was on the road. That's where they were comforted, tested, formed, and transformed. It's kind of interesting if you think about it. Here we are this morning. So many of us are here doing what we're doing and the way we're doing it because we have picked or been picked by this road, this way called Jesus. Now, if I was a little braver at this moment or I thought you were a little braver, I would sing a song to you. But I don't feel that brave, so I'm going to read the song. It's um, Bilbo Baggins' song from Lord of the Rings, and it goes like this. The road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. 
Now far ahead the road has gone, and I must follow if I can, pursuing it with weary feet till it takes me to the larger way. Well, there's not a shoe in this room that doesn't contain a foot of clay, uh, a foot that will drag and stumble and grow weary, but it is on these feet, <laughs> like those of Bilbo, Bilbo Baggins, that we can choose to traverse that way less traveled that goes to the larger way. Look, there are a lot of other roads um, that we can follow, and, and so many of the other roads are more clearly marked, and they stretch us towards something more attainable, more realizable. But it is on this road that some adventurous souls have chosen to travel. Isaiah was one of those. Do you hear him in this 40th chapter? It's the language of the road. He says, prepare you, um, prepare you the road. He says, make straight in the desert a highway for our God and let the valleys rise up and the mountains be laid low. What's he doing? He's announcing a divine construction program. He's talking about um, a path that's being laid out that is going to go from Babylon, Assyria, all the way back homeward, you see. And it's interesting that the typical the typical path back then from Babylon to Israel, you would go the fertile crescent. You'd do everything you could to avoid the wilderness of the desert. But this one, look on your bulletin of the picture. It's going to be straight. It's going to be a straight road right through the desert because this is the way that God is traveling. The road goes ever on and on. Now, Isaiah, it's such an intriguing book. It's full of rich poetry. There's probably three different Isaiah authors from the Isaiah school. What do I know about this author, the 40th chapter? Well, I know his preeminent kind of task had been to try to mentor King Ahaz, and King Ahaz wasn't having it. He was bullheaded, an unbeliever, didn't want to do business with God. He'd rather have done business with the Assyrians. And so they came slipping in the back door. So many got in the back door before you know it, the, the Israel had been just laid waste. The best buildings had been raised, and the land looked like rapacious loggers had come in and just taken all the good timber. Israel had become a nation of stumps. And now some of the best of the people are in Assyria, in exile. And now Isaiah preaches once again, and this is what he says. God isn't finished with creation. He's not finished with you. He's not finished with me. There's a, a highway being built. It's leading us to where we need to be. Now, I want us to listen to Isaiah a little more this morning. I, I want to overhear him suggesting some thoughts for the road, this road that we're invited to travel. If you listen carefully to him, he'll say, keep your eye on the one who is traveling with us. In other words, keep your eye on where this road is going. There's some roads I've been on. Didn't take me where I wanted to go or as far as I thought. They really ended up being dead ends. Been there, done that, you know. Then there are those roads that, well, they're not really bad roads, but they just kind of take you, dump you back to where you started. Isaiah has a sense that this road is forever going on and on toward something, toward something worth traveling on toward. You, you need to keep that in mind. Isaiah knew that because the other side of this, you take two or three steps on this road and you realize you are part of this divine construction project. You're, you're, you're going to be a part of something that's going to give you a lifetime of delays and detours and deferred dreams. You're going to be engaged in goodness, just going headlong into evil on days in which evil seems to carry the headlines. This is, this is a God-sized construction project. You know what that's like. You feel the heavy burden of that on, on small shoulders. You find yourself putting your hands on tasks that you never see quite see completed. Uh, this is a project that takes more than a lifetime. Yeah. 
Isaiah knew that. He, he, he preached with power. He preached with eloquence. And people were falling asleep in the middle of his sermons. There were days he just said, nothing's really coming of this. But he kept moving and he kept asking these people to move with him. Why? Because he knew that, hey, this, um, this is really the only road that finally matters. Isaiah had a view of history. It wasn't just his alone. It was this prophetic view. It was a view called salvation history that was linear. He saw humanity and history not as little hamsters in a wheel going round and round. But we have this purpose that is always pulsing right beneath us, taking us somewhere. Even when you can't see it, it's there. It's called salvation history. It's moving us somewhere. And he had this ability to look out there and see God's future. That someday there would um, emerge this Messiah of light and truth. He foretold that. And he could see a day of final shalom, fulfillment, where the lion would lay down with the lamb. I, I remember being out on Wilderness Trail. Um, this is some years ago. And on this particular week, we started what we call the lower end down at White Laurel River down toward Damascus, and we were headed north. And I had a group of first-timers, mainly middle schoolers, and at first day, I, I knew it was going to be tough because we were going to be going up straight mountain, 17 switchbacks going up straight mountain. Uh, it was kind of a hot, humid day, and it would, it would take a lot out of you. We were about two switchbacks up, and this 13-year-old boy just sat down on the trail. He just said, that's it. I said, what do you mean that's it? He said, well, I'm finished. I said, well, do you see a phone booth? No. He said, I don't see your mama, and you're not going to be able to call her. We're not finished. We're, we're going. And he said, speaking to my mom, he said, what kind of mother would want their child to come out and be abused like this? <laughs> he even got theological. What kind of God would build and create a mountain and expect a little boy to climb it like this. Then he got, he got it kind of cynical, cynical. He said, you know, this is what we're going to do for four and a half days, and then we're just going to go back to that little parking lot where they let us out. And that's when I, that's when I had something to say. I said, are you, are you kidding? Wait a minute. Don't you know you're, you're with a group called Wilderness Trail? We don't ever go back to where we started. No, we start here. All I can tell you is, I was exaggerating a little, and I said, all I can tell you is, we're headed north. I don't know where we're going to come out, but we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're headed north, young man. But I said, I, I do know this, day four, this is, wh the, this is where we're going to get, we're going to get what's called the Virginia Highlands, called the Montana to the east, and there are these huge rock outcroppings. You're going to feel like you're in an old western movie, and there's going to be this one vista. You can see four states from that. And there are going to be these rolling highland meadows. You're going to see the wild ponies of Grayson tromping along them. He said, we're, we're, that's, that's where we're going. I said, yeah. He got up with a new briskness of step. He started walking for about 20 minutes. <laughs> and he, he sat down again, but this time he wasn't quite so cynical. He said, I... Could you tell me, tell me one more time about the Highlands of Virginia? Yeah. You see, if you get where you're going, where, where will you be? Isaiah always had a sense that this, this was not a circular journey. This wasn't one of those predictable journeys where you just get out and wander around and come back to the, where you left your cars in the parking lot. No. He knew this was always moving towards something called new life. Even on the days you couldn't really see it. That's where it was going. He knew you might as well roll up your old maps. Because your old maps, they're not going to take you there. They're not going to be good there. Why? Because you're going to find yourself in places you've never been before. A thought for the road. Keep your eye on where this road is going. Oh, but here's another one. Now, this, this is highway talk. And road talk has to do with going somewhere. You know, it's not, it's not about parking lots. It's not about just settling in. It's about getting up, and here's where you are, and here's where you could be. You know, highway talk is about get up, go on, keep moving. 
You, you, you know that that's not just in Isaiah. Do you know that's in the very rhythm of the universe? Have you thought about that? The gr giant stellar bodies right this moment that are whirling all out there around and above us. Um, they're all moving. Every little particle of matter in this room and in us, it's changing. Heat and light, what are, heat and light, that's just waves in motion. The atom once thought to be the one fixed reality, that's nothing but energy, something going somewhere. Right there in the very universe, you can hear it. Get up, keep growing, keep changing, keep moving. Do you know it's there in the construction of your bodies? Think about eyes where? Only in the front. Hands and tools to do the task in front of us. Feet facing in one direction. Get up, go on, keep moving. And you can hear it in the impulse of this scripture that comes from Isaiah. Prepare ye the road. Make a straight highway in the desert. Get up. We're going home. We're going to where we need to be. Now, the people, they needed to hear this. This is what you need to understand. When they first got to Assyria, oh, oh, oh they, were, they were chafing at the bit, all these strange customs and strange dress and strange worship. But now they've been here a while, and they just kind of accepted this as the new status quo. They made peace with it. They had circled the camels. They had put their tent stakes deeper and deeper into the ground, and no one was going much of anywhere. And Isaiah stirring them up. God's not finished with you, with us, with creation. Get up. Come on. Keep moving. Folks, I want you to hear it and sense it in the room today. This is Advent. Oh, I know Advent. We use words like watching and waiting. But it's always an act of waiting. This is a season of great spiritual impatience. Impatience for God's kind of future. For the promises that have not yet been fulfilled. This isn't days for us to fixate on where we were or where we are. But where we are to be. Listen. None of us. We are not what we are yet called to be. We are not where we ought to be. Whatever we have, no matter how much or how little, is not all that we need. So let's get up. Let's go on. Keep moving. As old Bilbo Baggins sang, now far ahead, the road has gone. God's out in front of us, calling us forward. Here, here's an Advent question to ask yourself. What... what, what little region of your life, your life before God, has been become too settled? Have you, have you been there for too long and you've put the stakes too deep into the ground? Maybe it has to do with your inward journey, or maybe for some of you more your outward journey. How about us as a church called Central? Where, where have we been parked for too long? Where is, where is the urge saying to us, right here, this part of your life, get up, come on. I've had a good moment in reading into this book called Isaiah again. And what strikes me about this book is not just the logic of the theological arguments. Yes, that's strong at times, but it's just the energy, the raw energy of this book. This is an author that's always breaking beyond the bounds of pedantic prose into the excess of poetry. Why? Because he's not talking about a little piddling God that wants to offer a pinch of religion. He's talking about a restless, creative, ingenious God who is always out in front of us, having something more in mind, suggesting a larger way for us and for the world. I'll close with this story. I love it because it, it, it is a true story. And it comes from Wes Seeliger, uh, who was an Episcopal priest in Texas. And one day he takes off his clerical collar. You know, our, my Episcopal brothers and sisters, they often wear clerical. He took that off, and he's out because he's motorcycle shopping. That's right, Houston, Texas, goes into a rather large and sophisticated motorcycle shop, and he is drooling over a Honda 750. Now, this is a big machine. This is a big two-wheel machine. He's walking all the way around it, just admiring it, looking at it, and the salesman comes up. And the salesman sees him drooling over, and he says, man, this is some machine. 
oh, this baby will really fly. You know, on this thing, you can pop a wheelie in third. You, you, you can get out there on the road. You can cruise at 125 miles an hour like, like it's nothing. This thing will really haul it. Some mach- yeah, it sounds like it's really fast. And the salesman now is getting pretty excited. And he says, you know, you know, when you drive one of these into town, it's not like a car. You drive a car into town, you pull up at stoplight, nobody's noticing, big deal. Aha, you're in a little car. You know, you drive into town one of these things, it's like a neon sign on wheels. Oh, when you roll up to the traffic light, and you just let those pipes growl a little bit. And the people around you, they're going to take up and take notice. Nobody's going to want to mess with you. Man, this is some mean machine. Yeah, yeah, says Sheila. And now the uh, salesman says, oh, by the way, what do you do for a living? Um, I'm a clergyman. Suddenly, the enthusiasm of the conversation took a downward shift. And Seeliger said that the salesman at this point actually folded his hands, something like this, and <laughs> got, got into this posture, and he goes, uh, 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 Reverend, you, you know, these, these motorcycles, they're really much more practical than you might imagine. <laughs> Have you read the numbers? They get excellent gas mileage. And, <laughs> and uh, 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 Reverend, you know these, um, they're really much safer than people have advertised. You know, look, look, when you're on a motorcycle, you have total visibility. <laughs> and, um, you know, you, you, they, they can stop on a dime. These really are, are, are very practical, much safer than people think. Now, that's the end of the true part of the story. Observation. Lawnmower salesmen are not surprised to find a clergy in their shop looking around. Motorcycle salesmen are. What does that say about clergy? All right, let me take it a little farther. What does that say about the church? What does that say about Christians? Lawnmowers, slow, safe, Sane, boring, (laughs) motorcycles, fast, wild, adventurous, thinking out loud. Is being a Christian more like mowing the lawn or riding a motorcycle? Does it appeal to the settled or to the adventurous? Is God just the sleepy old man upstairs, or is God the restless creative power within all that is? I know where Isaiah votes. He votes for the latter. We have a pilgrim God of a pilgrim people. The road is already stretched. God is already traveling it. It's time for us to hit the road. You know, this is Advent, folks. We're going to be listening to Isaiah. You know, the best thing, I think, for us to do is to take this faith, to take this church of ours, get it out there on the road, and give it some gas and see what the old baby will do.